future unfed. The baby formula shortage crisis deepens as desperate parents scramble to feed their infants. Shelves bare. What's available stored behind lock and key. Caretakers only able to get a small supply at every store. Tonight, President Biden's new move to help frantic families. Wall Street freefall. The Dow takes a major dive, stoking fears of a possible recession. And as the Dow dips, gas prices spike. A concerning new record at pumps across all 50 states. Tonight, all the news you need to know about your money. Another red flag and potential missed opportunity. The investigation into the deadly racially motivated attack in Buffalo, uncovering that the accused teen shooter invited a small group of people to an online chat just moments before opening fire, killing 10 black people at a grocery store. Now the renewed calls for tougher red flag gun control laws. He's only six and he was so sweet. Loss of innocent lives on high-speed battlefields. Tonight, our I-Team takes a closer look at the increase of interstate shooting incidents over the last two years, the startling spike in violence, and the multi-city crackdown effort to curb freeway shootings. It must have been road rage, you know? It took me a minute to realize they just shot at each other and then some people ran the red light. A closely watched, highly contested race deadlocked. Just a few hundred votes will decide the primary battle for the Pennsylvania Republican Senate nomination. The showdown, a test of the power of former President Trump's endorsement as he's already expressing doubt about the results. Serving up a taste of community, our Juju Chang sits down with two chefs who are fighting back against AAPI hate with food. Why is food such a great window into culture? The first time you experience another culture, most likely, it's probably through food, right? It's kind of like a, the, the gateway into like learning about someone's like family, history, culture. Good evening. I'm Janae Norman in for Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Votes still being counted tonight after a pivotal night of primaries. In Pennsylvania, the race between Trump endorsed Dr. Mehmet Oz and David McCormick is neck and neck. The candidates separated by just several thousand votes. Which candidate becomes the GOP nominee could go a long way to determine which party will control the Senate after the midterms. Voters across the country growing increasingly frustrated with inflation. The cost of nearly everything on the rise, especially at the pump. The average price of a gallon of gas well north of $4 tonight. Wall Street also plunging again today. We'll get to all of that in just a moment. But first, we begin with what so many parents are anxious about tonight, that baby formula shortage. When will production be able to ramp up again? And what happens in the meantime? Tonight, the administration taking action and invoking the Defense Production Act to try and fill the gaps. President Biden signing the order a short time ago. And Chief White House correspondent Cecilia Vega joins us now with more on this breaking headline. And Cecilia, walk us through this, the steps that the president is taking tonight. Well, Janae, we've all been covering this for so long, so we know President Biden has been under growing pressure, including from Democrats, members of his own party on this one. And of course, we've heard that desperation from so many families around the country. So let me tell you exactly what this does, because it's all coming in right now. Just a few minutes ago, President Biden signing this paperwork. This is invoking that Defense Production Act. That, of course, is the tool that we've seen used in so many of these desperate situations situations recently like that need for critical protective gear during the pandemic. So today, this is forcing suppliers to prioritize sending ingredients to these formula makers. The White House says this is going to ensure that these factories have the ingredients they need to ramp up production. They're also now enlisting commercial planes that are already being used by the Defense Department to pick up infant formula from countries abroad, transform that transport that formula back here to the United States. This is formula that, of course, is going to have to meet American health requirements. But really, Janae, the bottom line right now, the FDA has been saying all along, we could be looking at weeks before these store shelves are filled up. And from what we're hearing, we're still, even despite this move today, still potentially looking at weeks before parents get that relief that they need. Weeks, but desperate parents out there who will welcome this news. Yes. Cecilia, thank you so much. And now to the latest on last night's midterm primaries in five states with that one key race still unresolved tonight. Pennsylvania's Republican Senate race between Dr. Mehmet Oz and former hedge fund CEO Dave McCormick remains too close to call tonight and likely headed for a recount. Here's ABC's Rachel Scott in Pennsylvania. 
In Pennsylvania tonight, election workers counting the mail-in ballots that could decide their squeaker of a Republican Senate primary. Fewer than 2,000 votes, now separating TV doctor Mehmet Oz, who has a slight lead, and former hedge fund executive David McCormick. When all the votes are tallied, I am confident we will win. On election night, Oz paying special tribute to former President Donald Trump, whose endorsement lit a fire under his campaign. God bless you, sir, for putting so much effort into this race. I will make you proud. But today, Trump urged Oz not to wait for all the votes to be counted. Dr. Oz should declare victory, the former president said. It makes it much harder for them to cheat with the ballots that they just happened to find. There is no evidence whatsoever of cheating in the Republican primary, and neither of the leading candidates has challenged its legitimacy. Now we have tens of thousands of uh, mail-in ballots that have not been counted, that are going to need to be counted, but we can see the path ahead. We can see victory ahead. The winner will go head-to-head -head with Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman, who scored a decisive win in the Democratic Senate primary after suffering a stroke just days earlier. He filled out his absentee ballot from his hospital room, his wife Giselle filling in for him at his party. You may have noticed I am not John Fetterman, <laughs> the next senator of our great state. Fetterman implanted with a pacemaker just hours earlier, his wife calling it all a, quote, hiccup on the road. And John is going to be back on his feet in no time. And Rachel Scott joins me now from Pennsylvania. Rachel, what do we know about any ballots that still need to be counted? And what's the time frame for getting those done before a potential re recount? Well, Janae, this is going to take a lot of patience for the voters here in Pennsylvania because there's still tens of thousands of mail-in ballots that need to be counted. And then once that count is over, if the two candidates are still less than a 0.5 margin apart, that's going to trigger an automatic recount. And that would likely take weeks, Janae. So we could be watching this for weeks. Rachel Scott in Pennsylvania, thank you. We turn now to the steep drop in the stock market today. The Dow Jones average with its worst single day loss since June 2020, losing more than 1,100 points or more than 3.5%. The NASDAQ and S&P 500 also seeing big drops. So let's bring in our chief business and economics correspondent, Rebecca Jarvis. Rebecca, thank you for being with us. We've seen this massive volatility in the market in recent weeks over fears of inflation and interest rate hikes. But what in particular triggered today's latest sell off. Well, Janae, it's hard to watch for anyone out there with a 401k. The market so far this year is down about 18 percent. When you zoom out to the last five years, it's actually up 65 percent. That is the good news. The problem here is what bellwethers like Target are telling us about the economy. Target came out with earnings today and their earnings showed that in the face of this rising inflation that we all feel, Target too is feeling the pinch and they're also seeing it show up from consumers who are buying less things inside of Target because of how they're feeling about prices. And the problem with all of that is that our economy, the American economy, is a consumer driven economy. How we spend, how we behave, Janae, that dictates how the economy behaves going forward. And for many, the look of things is that this spells a slowdown ahead. And given that, Rebecca, the Fed chair said yesterday that the overall economy is healthy, that consumers are still spending despite higher prices, and we're seeing those strong employment numbers. So why is there such a concern for a potential recession? It's a delicate balance. On the one hand, as you say, we have a very strong jobs picture right now. There are more, far more job openings, a record number of job openings versus the number of unemployed. But inflation is deeply embedded in our economy right now. Rents are higher, groceries are higher, gasoline is higher. Across the board, it's higher and wages aren't keeping up. And the longer that type of thing lasts, the more deeply ingrained it becomes in the economy, the harder it is for Americans to spend money, to, to actually fulfill the their budgets and put food on the table and that's a big concern for the Federal Reserve it's a big concern for politicians as well and that is why you're going to be hearing so much about this inflation word and the possibility of a recession ahead a number of economists were surveyed by the conference board 133 of them 68 percent Janae expect a recession ahead Janae wow. and of course that has big implications for the average American family Rebecca Jarvis thank you 
Turning now to disturbing new details today about the 18-year-old suspected shooter and how he allegedly posted his plans online just 30 minutes before authorities say he carried out the deadly racist rampage. ABC's Stephanie Ramos is in Buffalo for us tonight as we're learning New York's governor now having her attorney general focus on those reported social media posts. Tonight, investigators building their case against the suspect accused of opening fire at a supermarket in Buffalo. As ABC News has learned, just minutes before the deadly rampage, some of the 18-year-old's alleged posts on Discord were shared online with a small group. A spokesperson for the social media platform saying in a statement, a private invite-only server was created by the suspect to serve as a personal diary chat log. Approximately 30 minutes prior to the attack, however, a small group of people were invited to and joined the server. Before that, our records indicate no other people saw the diary chat log in this private server. It remains unclear who exactly had access to the writings. Tonight, New York's Governor Kathy Hochul now calling on the Attorney General to investigate the social media sites used by the alleged shooter. The suspect, Peyton Gendron, now charged in what authorities are calling a racially motivated attack at the Topps grocery store where 10 were killed and three others injured, all of the dead black. Investigators now combing through a nearly 600-page document they say contains those Discord posts which chronicle a deadly plot set in motion back in November. Just months earlier, the suspect was investigated by state police for making disturbing comments about murder-suicide in an online class last June. Tonight, the district attorney for Broome County saying the suspect told authorities he was just joking and that the school and police followed protocol. The New York State Police followed up appropriately on what the school district advised them of. They properly transported the individual to Binghamton General Hospital for a mental health evaluation. At that point in time, he was found not to be dangerous at that time, and he was released to the custody of his family. According to the district attorney, the teenager made no direct threat to the school or any student and firearms were not mentioned. State police and the school never filed a court petition that would have triggered the state's red flag law. This allowed the suspect to legally buy the assault style rifle authorities say he used in the attack. And Stephanie Ramos continues in Buffalo for us tonight. Stephanie, there is quite a bit of criticism pointing to New York's red flag law that in theory could have possibly stopped this shooter. Any new information on what exactly happened? Yesterday, so the suspect was evaluated and then he was released to his parents. No red flag referral was ever made to the court, but the governor's new executive order would now make it mandatory for state police to flag someone they believe to be a threat like the suspect and prevent them from possessing weapons. Janae. So a big change that could make a big difference. Stephanie Ramos, thank you so much. Well, turning now to the war in Ukraine overseas tonight, where there are several developments. Russia's defense ministry says more than 1,000 Ukrainian fighter, fighters from the steel mill in Mariupol have been taken to Russian-held territory where they face an uncertain fate. Meanwhile, Finland and Sweden officially submitted their applications to join NATO. And for the first time since the invasion, the U.S. Embassy in Kiev is open again. Here's ABC's senior foreign correspondent, Ian Panel. Tonight, as the war in Ukraine rages, President Biden welcoming Finland and Sweden as they made their bids to join NATO official today. Biden will meet with the leaders of both countries tomorrow at the White House. On the ground, Russia claiming almost a thousand fighters have surrendered at the Avastal steel plant in Mariupol. The fate of the fighters remains uncertain, with Moscow signaling it may try them as war criminals. And in Kyiv, the first war crimes trial of a captured Russian soldier resumed. The defendant pleading guilty to shooting a 62-year-old civilian, the man's grieving widow, in court. The soldier now facing life in prison. It's just the first of many alleged war crimes cases in Ukraine. I mean, I'm sure you can hear that. We've come out to one of the liberated villages, but the road is testament to the battles that are being fought here. This is a Russian tank has been totally destroyed, it's now rusting. But down there is pretty much where the front lines are. We're not going to go much closer down there, but you can hear the sound of the battles being fought all around here. Ruska Lazova was liberated from Russian occupation just three weeks ago. But that doesn't mean it's safe for the residents to return home. 
Now, less than 200 remain in a village where 5,000 used to live. Although Putin's troops have withdrawn back towards their own border, they still indiscriminately shell the town. I was going to ask you how the battle's going. Well, I can hear how it's going. Deputy Commander Roman says active combat is still going on. He expects the Russians to counter at any time, but says his forces are trying to teach them a lesson they'll never forget. In a nearby village, another Russian attack. Our escorts get nervous. Sending up too many signals. They think the Russians could track everyone's phones and target the area. They advise us to leave the village. But these are the dangers too many Ukrainians must now live with every day. Janay, in a further sign that the Russians are having real problems here in Ukraine, the Pentagon saying that Moscow's main offensive in the Donbass, that's in the east of the country, the part of the country, that actually the Russians said they were now going to focus on, is shrinking in size and scale. And that after all this time, the Russians are still making little progress there. Here in the northeast, we know that the Russians have been pushed back close to their border, although, as you saw in that report, they do still shell areas where they've been driven out. Uh, the, we know that they didn't make any kind of progress around Kyiv. In the south of the country, they are trying to make progress there. But overall, these are all indications that actually Putin's battle plan on the ground has not gone to plan. And it's also a sign, given the application to enlarge NATO, uh, that his broader geopolitical ambitions are also being thwarted. Janae? Ian, thanks. Back home now and to the pandemic and new signs of a looming summer surge. Cases rising to the highest point since mid-February. Daily hospital admissions projected to increase in at least 48 states in the next month. And in just the next two weeks, experts anticipate as many as 5,300 more Americans could die from the virus. Whit Johnson reports. Tonight, COVID hospitalizations again on the rise, up more than 60% in the last month. And now a new projection shows nearly every state will see more Americans with COVID going into hospitals in the next two weeks and more patients will die. In areas where community levels are high, everyone should be using prevention measures and wearing a mask in public indoor settings. 137 counties nationwide now in the high-risk alert level, meaning there is increasing pressure on the health system. New York City also in that category, but for now officials are resisting a mask mandate, instead only recommending them indoors. We are not allowing COVID to outsmart us. We're staying prepared and not panicking. And tonight the White House sounding the alarm about the need for Congress to act on COVID funding. We will find ourselves in the fall or winter uh, with people getting infected and no treatments available for them because we will have run out. It comes as the CDC is expected to recommend boosters for 5 to 11-year-olds as early as tomorrow. I started looking online right away to see about scheduling a shot for her. To have the booster is just an extra level of assurance. Pfizer says its booster shot is safe, and an initial analysis found it increased antibodies against Omicron 36-fold. A lot of parents are going to be asking, if I get my child this booster shot, will my child need another shot this fall? And the simple answer is we just don't know. But it's important that we focus on the ways to protect everyone right now while we're seeing cases rise all over the country. New child COVID infections are at their highest point since February, and hospital admissions are now climbing too, up 70 percent in the last month. And Whit Johnson joins us now. Whit, we know the second booster is available for people over 50, but more than half of eligible Americans haven't even gotten their first booster. Tonight, the CDC guidance has shifted for people weighing that second booster shot. How has it changed? Well, Janae, the CDC now says you may consider waiting to get that second booster shot if you've had COVID within the past three months or if getting the shot now would discourage you from getting one in the fall. That's when health officials are hoping to roll out this next generation of improved vaccines that could help head off another winter surge. Janae. Good information. Whit, thank you so much. And next to the severe weather threat tonight, damaging winds and hail from Minneapolis to Raleigh by tomorrow and the soaring heat in the south fueling this wildfire you see in central Texas near Abilene now spreading east. And more than 100 million Americans will see temperatures above 90 degrees tomorrow. Let's bring in Rob Marciano, who's tracking it all. Hey, Rob. Hi, Janae. You know, that sort of heat and dry air, especially in the west, is really a product of our warming world here. 
in May. We got a lot of red on the map. You mentioned the red flag warnings. They're up in at least nine states from California through Colorado into Kansas and probably going to be there for the next two or three days. Very strong winds over very dry air, and that's uh, that makes things right for wildfires as we've already seen this month. Severe thunderstorm watches up posted for parts of Colorado, including the springs, parts of Wisconsin, and also Kentucky. And this system kind of splits tomorrow, and we'll probably see severe weather in similar spots uh, just south of Minneapolis, a, a large hail bullseye there, and then from Springfield, Missouri, uh, Parking across uh, the Tennessee Valley in through the uh, Carolinas by tomorrow afternoon and tomorrow evening. Damaging winds, scattered hail, maybe a few uh, thunderstorms that have tornadoes as well. And here's your heat. Boy, it just doesn't quit in Texas. It hit 100 degrees for the fourth time already this season in uh, San Antonio. To give you an idea, it already hit. It hit 103 times only uh, last year uh, in the month in this month and we're looking at 90s that spread across parts of the south and that's the heat that's going to spread into the northeast as we head toward this weekend so everybody uh, in the northeast will feel it like it's summertime unusual for this time of year for sure Janae try to stay cool unusual but Rob I'll take it thank you Rob Marciano you got it and when we come back, the flight from Colorado to Florida landing with one more passenger than it took off with. Plus, he's an NFL star that's now aiming to become a Georgia senator. Our revealing report tonight on Herschel Walker. And it's not just grocery stores, churches, schools, or malls. Up next, the threat facing drivers on our nation's highways. It's something we don't often think about. Our in-depth look at how our roads are becoming battlegrounds, too. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Okay, we made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The hottest news in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to see. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out. Unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, you could be putting your life at risk. The darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money, that's all we do. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. 
Welcome back. Millions of Americans use them every day to get to and from school and work. But tonight, our highways are increasingly becoming dangerous battlegrounds, shootings surging during the pandemic. Our chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas, brings us highway gunplay in ABC News Prime and I-Team investigation. Black Jeep that they took off in is just no, 10 blocks north of us right now. This driver opening fire during the morning rush in Miami. Someone in a passing car started shooting. They got on I-10 East. The suspect fired several times at the Castro's truck. The freeways are dangerous and there's no end in sight. It's just ridiculous. Innocent people out there are getting hurt, killed for nothing. Tonight, the startling rise in gun violence along some of the nation's busiest streets and interstate highways now turned high-speed battlefields. Our investigation with ABC-owned stations, unearthing some of the most dangerous stretches of the 47,000 miles of interstates in America, perhaps the newest symptom of a startling rise in gun violence. Our Chicago station, WLS, was on the scene with Illinois State Police pursuing a potentially stolen vehicle. OK, hit your vehicle right there, right there. Suddenly, the officers have a suspect vehicle surrounded. Police discover an assault rifle in the back seat and hollow point bullets. We're recovering handguns that are fully auto that have, uh, you know, upwards of 50 rounds that are available. It's a huge issue. A stunning reminder that our nation's highways and streets appear to have more drivers and passengers with guns at their fingertips. An ABC News review of data collected by the Gun Violence Archive, an independent research group, finds shooting incidents along or near interstates spiked 57 percent between 2019 and 2021. Over that period, there were 2,143 incidents, more than 1,200 people injured, and at least 530 killed. In California, the same day as the Chicago incident, a fight breaks out at a busy intersection. Within seconds, shots fired. It must have been road rage, you know? It took me a minute to realize they just shot at each other and then some people ran the red light. Traffic stops have decreased. So now a small, you know, altercation, someone cuts someone off on the road, that can quickly escalate. What used to be a small altercation now becomes a shooting or a homicide. From road rage, like this man in Florida, brazenly firing at another driver through his own windshield, to targeted killings and running gun battles. You've got what police chiefs are looking at and calling the pandemic impact on crime. It cannot be underestimated. Our investigation with ABC-owned stations found stretches of highway with some of the highest numbers of gun violence incidents were along Interstate 10 in New Orleans. I-94 in Chicago, and I-240 in Memphis, Tennessee. Those three areas alone reported at least 178 incidents between 2019 and 2021, and accounted for at least 152 injuries and 28 deaths. To be clear, these statistics are not just numbers, but tragedies of incalculable loss. He's only six, and he was so sweet. Little Aiden Leos, just six years old, shot and killed as he was riding in the backseat of his mom's car in Orange County, California. His sister described the moment bullets tore through the vehicle and hit her baby brother. He said, Mommy, my tummy hurts. So she went and she picked him up, and he was bleeding on her. In Houston, road rage blamed for cutting two lives short. 17-year-old David Castro was killed while leaving an Astros game last summer. And just last week, Tyler Mitchell died after being shot during a road rage incident on I-10. Family members say he was making plans to celebrate his 22nd birthday. An investigation by a Houston station found highways, roads, streets, and alleys are the second most common place homicides occur in the city. Enough is enough. This, this world needs to get to where everybody can get along. Courtney Bradford was a young man with the world before him, about to be married, had just bought a new home with his fiance. 
and he so loved and doted over their five-year-old daughter. It's, it's very hard. I still have those moments where I forget. I've called him by mistake. But he'll never answer. Courtney was shot and killed while riding on Interstate 240 in Memphis. His mother says it's her faith that has helped her stay strong during her grief. I don't have any more children. My prayer has been, Lord, don't let me lose my mind. And so far, he's keeping me. The shooting that took Courtney's life was one of the 121 interstate shootings Memphis police responded to in 2021. It's insane. Now I get antsy when I'm on the expressway. The data shows the surge in highway and street shootings coincided with the overall spike in gun violence that accompanied the pandemic. We haven't seen this kind of increase since the 90s. You got more people carrying, more stolen guns. This is the pandemic effect. Some police departments are responding. In Illinois, they're trying to do a better job of tracking suspects with new cameras along the interstates. They're also doing more patrols and searches to arrest people with illegal weapons in their vehicles. We will use license plate readers. We will use our air operations. We will use our patrol officers that are out there. We'll use canines. We'll use all the tools that are at our disposal to be able to pursue the people that are responsible for this violence. Police are trying to stop these shootings before they happen, because when these crimes do happen in traffic, they can be much more difficult to solve. The evidence in the crime scene is moving sometimes 70, 80, 90 miles an hour. Police departments in the Detroit area are hoping to add cameras to their efforts to cut down on interstate crimes. Officers say they've seen an average of five freeway shootings a month over the past three years. Nobody's looking to write a ticket for speeding with, the, with, with cameras on the freeway. We're talking about cameras that can save lives if someone uses a weapon on a freeway, which puts every single person, every family, at risk in every community, not just Detroit. Detroit police teamed up with more than three dozen other law enforcement agencies to launch Operation Bryson last year. It's a multi-city effort aimed to crack down on freeway shootings. The operation was named after two-year-old Bryson Christian, who was killed last year when someone opened fire on his family's vehicle on I-75. Police say it was a case of mistaken identity. Living without Bryson, all the memories, you know, it still makes me teary-eyed. Two alleged gang members have been charged with murder in Bryson's death. But there's still no resolution to Courtney's murder. Latoya has done interviews on radio, TV, and social media trying to spark interest in his case. We don't know what happened at all. We don't know who's involved. Even if police do find the killer, she knows it won't bring Courtney back. I don't want anyone to ever feel what I feel. I don't want anybody to feel what she feels. I pray a lot, because one thing I don't want to be is angry, because that's what I was at first. I was angry, I was confused, and I was in disbelief, and you know, some days I'm still in disbelief. We gonna keep praying and we gonna keep the faith. That's all I have. A big thanks just to Pierre for bringing us that piece. Still ahead here on Prime, he angered many for infamously hiking the price of life-saving medication. And tonight, there's a major update in the saga of the so-called pharma bro. A circus without animals? Why some are applauding. And gas prices still on the move. We take a look by the numbers coming up. But first, our tweet of the day. So many Haitian Americans beaming with pride on this Haitian flag day. you go into the black market, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. This is ABC News Live.
is the crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black markets, you could be putting your life at risk. The darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money, that's all we do. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. These days, with so much going on, it's hard to keep up. While others are recapping yesterday's headlines, we're bringing you the right now. This is the busy border crossing. Steel barricades, another strike. The right now look at the day ahead, how it affects you and your family. Record high gas prices. The threat of cyber warfare. Is peace possible? World News Now beginning at 2 a.m. Eastern, followed by America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Streaming here on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated abcnews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at abcnews.com. And here's to everything ahead. And the upward spiral of gas prices reaching a new milestone this week. So let's take a look by the numbers. For the first time, all 50 states now have an average price of $4 for a gallon of unleaded gas. That's according to a report by AAA. Three states, Georgia, Kansas, and Oklahoma, have all surpassed an average of $4 a gallon this week for the first time, now joining the rest of the country. $4.56. That's the average price per gallon nationally right now up 48 cents from just a month ago. Six, that's the number of states, including California, Hawaii, Nevada, Washington, Oregon, and Alaska, all with average prices more than $5 a gallon. At a whopping $6.05, that's the average price for a gallon of gas in California today, according to AAA, the highest in the country. That number could move even higher as we approach the summer travel season. But it is worth noting that the summer of 2008 featured even higher national average gas prices, which would be over $5 today after adjusting for inflation. But that's likely little comfort for so many Americans who are feeling the pain at the pump right now. And we still have a lot to get to here on Prime tonight. The former Minneapolis police officer pleading guilty to manslaughter in the killing of George Floyd. And we're not talking about Derek Chauvin. Plus, how two chefs are coming together to use food to stop hate against Asian Americans. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places, but crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. 
Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find. Unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Results pouring in from the critical primaries across five states, North Carolina, Kentucky, Idaho, Oregon, and the battleground state of Pennsylvania, where the Republican Senate primary between hedge fund CEO David McCormick and TV doctor Mehmet Oz is still neck and neck, with far-right commentator Kathy Barnett trailing further behind. As for the Pennsylvania Democratic Senate race, Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman winning the race just days after suffering a stroke. In North Carolina, a shocking defeat for Republican incumbent 26-year-old Madison Cawthorn, losing the race to State Senator Chuck Edwards. Cawthorn has been a subject of scrutiny recently after a series of scandals, including taking a gun through airport security. Cawthorn tweeting his congratulations to Edwards overnight. In a landmark deal, the U.S. Soccer Federation has agreed to pay players on its men's and women's teams equally. U.S. Soccer President Cindy Parlo Cohn calling it a historic moment. You know, it's game-changing moment here in the U.S., but it has the potential to change how international soccer and international sport do business. The deal closes the pay gap and prize money between what soccer's governing body, FIFA, awards for the men's and women's World Cups. In 2019, the U.S. women's title came with a $4 million prize, compared to the $38 million purse France's men's team took home for their World Cup win in 2018. Under the collective bargaining agreements, the teams will pool the prize money from their respective World Cup appearances and split the total among the two teams and the federation. A guilty plea from former Minneapolis police officer Thomas Lane of second-degree manslaughter and the killing of George Floyd. The plea allows Lane to avoid a state trial for his role in Floyd's killing and instead face sentencing. Lane had been accused of holding down Floyd's legs. His fellow officer Derek Chauvin held his knee on Floyd's neck, killing him. Two other officers are still facing trial for their alleged roles. Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison says Lane's acknowledgement he did something wrong is an important step toward healing the wounds of the Floyd family, our community, and the nation. Martin Shkreli is out of prison. His lawyer says the man, infamously known as Farmer Bro, was released after serving five years of a seven-year sentence for securities fraud and other offenses. Shkreli was the former head of Turing Pharmaceuticals and earned widespread criticism for drastically raising the price of HIV medication, Daraprim, by 4,000%. He was convicted of securities fraud in 2017 in connection with his work at two hedge funds before he started Turing Pharmaceuticals. The circus is coming back to town. Ringling Brothers and Barnum and & Bailey Circus will make its great return with a 50-city tour after a five-year absence. A major difference this time around, no animals. Feld Entertainment, which puts on the circus, promises new technologies, a 360-degree experience, interactive elements in each show. Auditions taking place around the world. The greatest show on Earth starts in September 2023. A Frontier Airlines flight from Denver to Orlando receiving an unexpected arrival when a passenger went into labor in the air. The airline says a heroic flight attendant stepped in to help the new mother to the back lavatory and help her deliver the baby. Thanks to a team effort, the flight was diverted to Pensacola where paramedics were ready at the gate. To remember the experience, the mother gave the baby a fitting middle name, Sky. 
Well, now to the midterms. Control of the U.S. Senate could come down to the crucial state of Georgia yet again this year. That state will hold its primary next week, and former football star Herschel Walker is the front runner on the GOP ticket for Senate after being endorsed by former President Trump. But Walker is facing questions about his mental health and new concerns about old allegations of domestic violence and threats dating back over two decades. 14 years ago, ABC's Bob Woodruff had a far-reaching conversation with Walker and his ex-wife about his complex mental health diagnosis. And tonight, Bob has an update on that report and how Walker's campaign and his opponents are responding today. With a past where winning is everything. He's running over people. Herschel Walker has his eyes on the prize, hoping to win the coveted Senate seat in his home state of Georgia. <laughs> He's a football icon and Heisman Trophy winner, playing for the University of Georgia and later the Dallas Cowboys. A successful businessman and the Trump-backed Republican favorite in one of the most closely watched contests this year, a race that could once again tip the balance of the Senate. I'm a kid from a small town in Georgia who's lived the American dream, and I'm ready to fight to keep that dream alive for you too. But a lesser-known part of that past now threatens his road to victory, as allegations of violence or threats by three women, including his ex-wife Cindy, are resurfacing. He got a gun, and he put it to my temple. Put the gun right to your temple? Mm-hmm. And what did he say? I'm going to blow your effing brains out. If you've held a gun to your wife's head and threatened to blow it off, you're a bad man. And that Georgians deserve better. But you see, while his opponents cry foul, the story is a little more complicated. Walker did not deny holding the gun to his ex-wife's head. He said in a 2008 interview with me on Nightline that he just does not remember. He told me he lives with dissociative identity disorder, once called multiple personality disorder, something we discussed when he was publicizing his book about living with DID. It's just personality that can do different things for you. I told somebody once, you don't want the Herschel that play football. You don't want the Herschel that do business babysitting your child. You want a different person. When I'm competing, I'm a totally different person. First thing I thought was he had the devil in him or something. In 2008, I also spoke with Cindy Grossman, Walker's college sweetheart, his wife for 19 years, and the mother of his son. I saw altars. I saw um, voice changes. Is there any way you can tell me the difference in his voice from one altar to another? Raspy. He would say things like he didn't know who I was. His own wife? Right. But, well, he, he didn't recognize He would you? refer to me as Miss Lady. Did he for forget what your name was? I don't think he knew. Really? Mm -mm. It's hard to explain. Even his physical countenance would change. After his retirement from football, Walker said as many as 12 of his distinct alternate personalities began to assert control. In 2001, with a loaded pistol in his car, he says he thought about killing a man over a trivial business dispute. In your book, you write, the visceral enjoyment I'd get from seeing the small entry wound and spray of brain tissue and blood, like a 4th of July firework. Right. You got into a position where you were really about to commit murder. Well, I don't know whether you're going to commit murder, but the thing is, I'm not going to shy away from violence. But do you, did you want to kill that guy? Oh, yeah, I did want to kill him. Yeah, I did. He tells the story that he was on the edge of wanting to kill someone. Oh, yeah. I was <laughs> probably one of them. Do you think he wanted to kill you? He said he did. He said that to you? Put the gun to my temple. He had the gun right to your head? What did he say? I'm going to blow your effing brains out. I just must have had the strength of God in me because I just looked him in the eye and I said, go ahead, pull the trigger. I know where I'm going. Do you know where you're going? Walker did not deny he threatened his wife, but claimed he had no memory of it. Do you not remember something like that because you think that was a, an, another altar or do you want to get out of having to talk about it? No, 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 no. I, I, if I can tell you, know, I'm talking about everything else. If I can remember, I'd talk about it. He says he doesn't remember a lot of the details of these. He may not, but I certainly do. Cindy said it wasn't just the one incident. There were other physical confrontations, 
including choking and multiple threats with different weapons. In 2001, police were called to their home in Irving, Texas. Officers reported that Walker talked about having a shootout with police. His gun was subsequently confiscated. Cindy has not responded to multiple requests for comment. In addition to Cindy, other women have made allegations against the former football star. In 2002, a former Dallas Cowboys cheerleader told police that about a year earlier, Walker had made threats to her and was having her house watched. ABC News has reached out to her, but she declined to comment on the incident. And in 2012, Micah Dean, who said they had an on-again, off-again relationship for two decades, told police that Walker had lost it after she tried to break up with him. She said he threatened to sit outside her apartment and blow her head off when she came outside. But at the end of the interview with police, she said, I don't know if I should report this, and that she doesn't want to get him in trouble. Still, the officer decided to document, based on what he wrote, were the extreme threats allegedly made to her. Micah Dean died in 2019, but in a statement provided to ABC News from the Walker campaign, Dean's mother says the family was never aware of the allegations and that they're very proud of the man Herschel Walker has become. We love him, pray for him, and wish we lived in Georgia so we could vote him into the United States Senate. Dean's mother and stepfather also served on the board of Renaissance Man, Inc., a company Walker led. In an interview with Axios last year, Walker denied the claims by Dean and the former cheerleader, saying people can't just make up and add on and say other things that's not the truth, and said he's never broken the law. Walker also told Axios he's accountable for his actions with his ex-wife and addressed his DID diagnosis but was vague, saying he's better now than 99% of the people in America. Just like I broke my leg, I put the cast on it, it healed. In 2008, Walker told me he had been in therapy for DID and was doing well. I've totally changed uh, from back then to where I'm at today. A lot of people may have these problems, but they are too ashamed or they're too scared to come out and say something. I said, I'm not ashamed because, guys, I'm human. I'm not nobody special, I'm just Herschel. Dr. J. Douglas Bremner specializes in trauma-related psychiatric disorders and says a full recovery is not typical. The treatment is long-term, so there's no quick, quick fixes. And I would say that the, 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 the goal would be more management of symptoms, and, and in some cases it can be eventual integration of, of personalities. Even though he has not treated Walker, he has treated patients with DID. Whether anyone with DID would be able to um, recover enough to be as highly functioned as a U.S. Senator, I, I, I couldn't say never. Um, although I'm, all I can do again is just repeat my experience that in general, DID is a highly symptomatic disorder and it has an impairment on work and, and social function. In a statement to ABC News, a spokesperson for the Walker campaign said, this is an obvious political hit job eight days before an election orchestrated by Herschel's primary opponents who are failing to get any sort of traction. Voters will see through it. Herschel addressed these issues in detail with Bob Woodruff 14 years ago. He even wrote a book about it. The same reporters who praised him for his courage are now trashing him because he is a Republican. It is shameful and is why good people don't run for office. Our thanks to Bob for that. As we continue to celebrate AANHPI Month, it's also important to acknowledge the ongoing hate the community has been battling, not just recently, but for years. ABC's Juju Chang introduces us to two chefs coming together to use food to try to stop the hate. Vietnamese flavors fused with his Cajun childhood. It's Chef Kevin Tien's specialty at his hot DC restaurant, Moon Rabbit. My mom was still in her teens when she had me. And as the oldest in like a, an Asian household, it's always the responsibility for us to take care of all the siblings. So for me, it was cooking for my little sister. Why is food such a great window into culture? The first time you experience another culture, most likely, it's probably through food, right? It's kind of like a the, the gateway into like learning about someone's like 
family, their history, their culture. Chef Tim Ma grew up in Arkansas. His parents' Chinese restaurant, the only one in town. Back in the 70s, they didn't always feel welcome. Me and my sister's bedroom, our window faced the street. Something got hurled, we heard glass breaking, and then we heard words, and then we heard people driving off. And so how did that come into play when you started seeing incidents of AAPI hate in a modern setting? It was more us thinking about the older generation because that's who you saw in the videos. And so like, you know, that looks like my mom, that looks like my grandfather. Last year, during the height of the pandemic, with attacks against Asian Americans spiking 339% across the country, the Friends felt a call to action. Growing up, it's always like, keep your head down, don't let things bother you, ignore everything and, and brush it to the side. But I think like years and years of brushing it to the side, I think a lot of people think you can like take advantage or talk down to the Asian community or never think they'll like speak up. Together they formed Chefs Stopping AAPI Hate as a way to fight back the best way they know how, with food. Me and Kevin and a few other Asian American chefs in DC and middle of the pandemic, um, the only thing we could really do was uh, these takeout dinners. We were like, okay, Five chefs, five courses, let's do a dinner. And it sold out like immediately. And then it just kind of like snowballed from there. In the past year, Chef Stopping AAPI Hate has raised about a half million dollars. The group expanding to New York, Detroit, San Francisco. Table 53 waiters. And pivoting to support causes as the needs arrive, hosting benefit dinners to help Ukrainian refugees. This is insane. This is so beautiful. At the center of it all, the incredible food. Our fried chicken is based off of gachian nuk mum, which is like a Vietnamese street food. Here we make our fish sauce caramel with a lot of smoked chilies, fresh chilies. And while we dig into this delicious banquet, the pair can't help but point out it's not just the food that's hot and spicy. Did you know in 2013, Tim was <laughs> Eater DC's sexiest chef? Wow. Wait, I did know that. Weren't you People Magazine's yes, sexiest exactly. chef? Yes, exactly. That's what. Uh, which is like, nice to, to see because, you know, like, normally, like, uh, like Asian men aren't perceived as sexy, right? A thousand percent. Yeah. But that's changing. You guys are changing that. Yeah, absolutely. Our thanks to Juju. And before we go tonight, the image of the day, it is Taylor Swift, or Dr. Swift, as you could call her now, at today's New York University graduation. The singer receiving an honorary degree from the school and giving the commencement speech. The singer spoke for about 25 minutes about going after your wildest dreams in the school's first in-person ceremony in two years. Congratulations to her and all of those graduates. That's our show for this hour. Please stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. And thank you for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, the growing concerns over monkeypox and the landmark victory for equal pay after the U.S. women's soccer team learned they would receive the same pay as men. But will that trickle down to the club teams? And what about other sports? We talk about it coming up. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. The deeper you go into the black market, the darker it gets. Traffic Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. The fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7 is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, 
but an unfriendly adversary. Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over. The world is not going to be the same. So what's good to read this summer? Well, Kate and I have decided to jump in and help you. And we're talking with Oprah, John Irving, and so many popular authors and influencers. So we want you to join us. Myself, Charlie Gibson, and my daughter, Kate Gibson. Oh, hey, that's me. That is you. For the new podcast series, it is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen anywhere and anytime. The Bookcase Podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Janae Norman. Thanks for streaming with us. We are monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. President Joe Biden is invoking the Defense Production Act to address the widespread shortage of baby formula. The White House announced tonight that move intended to get ingredients to manufacturers to help speed up production. And the president has also directed Department of Defense commercial aircraft to pick up infant formula overseas to get that on U.S. shelves faster while U.S. manufacturers ramp up production. A Massachusetts resident has tested positive for monkeypox. Health officials confirmed when Wednesday, making that the first case of the rare virus detected in the United States this year. The disease can spread from person to person via large respiratory droplets in the air, but they cannot travel more than a few feet, experts say. The most common symptoms include fever, headache, fatigue, and muscle aches. A convicted murderer who escaped from a prison transport bus in Texas last week is still on the run. Gonzalo Lopez, who is serving a life sentence, managed to get out of his restraints and a cage before stabbing the driver. Several law enforcement agencies are involved in the search, which has included aircraft and teams on horseback and canine teams. Authorities are offering a $50,000 reward for any information. Turning now to the latest on last night's midterm primaries in five states with that one key race still unresolved tonight. Pennsylvania's Republican Senate race between Dr. Mehmet Oz and former hedge fund CEO Dave McCormick remains too close to call and likely headed for a recount. Here's ABC's Rachel Scott in Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania tonight, election workers counting the mail-in ballots that could decide their squeaker of a Republican Senate primary. Fewer than 2,000 votes, now separating TV doctor Mehmet Oz, who has a slight lead, and former hedge fund executive David McCormick. When all the votes are tallied, I am confident we will win. On election night, Oz paying special tribute to former President Donald Trump, whose endorsement lit a fire under his campaign. God bless you, sir, for putting so much effort into this race. I will make you proud. But today, Trump urged Oz not to wait for all the votes to be counted. Dr. Oz should declare victory, the former president said. It makes it much harder for them to cheat with the ballots that they just happened to find. There is no evidence whatsoever of cheating in the Republican primary, and neither of the leading candidates has challenged its legitimacy. Now we have tens of thousands of uh, mail-in ballots that have not been counted, that are going to need to be counted, but we can see the path ahead. We can see victory ahead. The winner will go head to head with Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman, who scored a decisive win in the Democratic Senate primary after suffering a stroke just days earlier. He filled out his absentee ballot from his hospital room, his wife Giselle filling in for him at his party. You may have noticed I am not John Fetterman, <laughs> <laughs> the next senator of our great state. <laughs> Fetterman implanted with a pacemaker just hours earlier. His wife calling it all a, quote, hiccup on the road. And John is going to be back on his feet in no time. Our thanks to Rachel Scott there in Pennsylvania. Turning now to disturbing new details about the 18-year-old suspected shooter in Buffalo and how he allegedly posted his plans online just 30 minutes before authorities say he carried out that deadly racist rampage. New York's governor now having her attorney general shift her focus to social media. ABC's Stephanie Ramos back in Buffalo for us again tonight. 
Tonight, investigators building their case against the suspect accused of opening fire at a supermarket in Buffalo. As ABC News has learned, just minutes before the deadly rampage, some of the 18-year-old's alleged posts on Discord were shared online with a small group. A spokesperson for the social media platform saying in a statement, a private invite-only server was created by the suspect to serve as a personal diary chat log. Approximately 30 minutes prior to the attack, however, a small group of people were invited to and joined the server. Before that, our records indicate no other people saw the diary chat log in this private server. It remains unclear who exactly had access to the writings. Tonight, New York's Governor Kathy Hochul now calling on the Attorney General to investigate the social media sites used by the alleged shooter. The suspect, Peyton Gendron, now charged in what authorities are calling a racially motivated attack at the Topps grocery store where 10 were killed and three others injured, all of the dead black. Investigators now combing through a nearly 600-page document they say contains those Discord posts, which chronicle a deadly plot set in motion back in November. Just months earlier, the suspect was investigated by state police for making disturbing comments about murder-suicide in an online class last June. Tonight, the district attorney for Broome County saying the suspect told authorities he was just joking and that the school and police followed protocol. The New York State Police followed up appropriately on what the school district advised them of. They properly transported the individual to Binghamton General Hospital for a mental health evaluation. At that point in time, he was found not to be dangerous at that time, and he was released to the custody of his family. According to the district attorney, the teenager made no direct threat to the school or any student and firearms were not mentioned. State police and the school never filed a court petition that would have triggered the state's red flag law. This allowed the suspect to legally buy the assault style rifle authorities say he used in the attack. And our thanks to Stephanie Ramos. Millions of Americans use them every day to get to school, home from work. But tonight, our highways are increasingly becoming dangerous battlegrounds. Shootings surging during the pandemic. Our chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas, brings us highway gunplay in ABC News Prime and I-Team investigation. Black Jeep that they took off in is just no, 10 blocks north of us right now. This driver opening fire during the morning rush in Miami. Someone in a passing car started shooting. They got on I-10 East. The suspect fired several times at the Castro's truck. The freeways are dangerous and there's no end in sight. It's just ridiculous. Innocent people out there are getting hurt, killed for nothing. Tonight, the startling rise in gun violence along some of the nation's busiest streets and interstate highways now turned high-speed battlefields. Our investigation with ABC-owned stations, unearthing some of the most dangerous stretches of the 47,000 miles of interstates in America, perhaps the newest symptom of a startling rise in gun violence. Our Chicago station, WLS, was on the scene with Illinois State Police pursuing a potentially stolen vehicle. Okay, that's your vehicle right there, right there. Suddenly, the officers have a suspect vehicle surrounded. Police discover an assault rifle in the back seat and hollow point bullets. We're recovering handguns that are fully auto that have, uh, you know, upwards of 50 rounds that are available. It's a huge issue. A stunning reminder that our nation's highways and streets appear to have more drivers and passengers with guns at their fingertips. An ABC News review of data collected by the Gun Violence Archive, an independent research group, finds shooting incidents along or near interstates spiked 57% between 2019 and 2021. Over that period, there were 2,143 incidents, more than 1,200 people injured, and at least 530 killed. In California, the same day as the Chicago incident, a fight breaks out at a busy intersection. Within seconds, shots fired. It must have been road rage, you know? It took me a minute to realize they just shot at each other and then some people ran the red light. Traffic stops have decreased. So now a small, you know, altercation, someone cuts someone off on the road, that can quickly escalate what used to be a small altercation 
now becomes a shooting or a homicide. From road rage, like this man in Florida, brazenly firing at another driver through his own windshield, to targeted killings and running gun battles. You've got what police chiefs are looking at and calling the pandemic impact on crime. It cannot be underestimated. Our investigation with ABC-owned stations found stretches of highway with some of the highest numbers of gun violence incidents were along Interstate 10 in New Orleans, I-94 in Chicago, and I-240 in Memphis, Tennessee. Those three areas alone reported at least 178 incidents between 2019 and 2021, and accounted for at least 152 injuries 28 deaths. To be clear, these statistics are not just numbers, but tragedies of incalculable loss. He's only six, and he was so sweet. <sighs> Little Aiden Leos, just six years old, shot and killed as he was riding in the backseat of his mom's car in Orange County, California. His sister described the moment bullets tore through the vehicle and hit her baby brother. He said, Mommy, my tummy hurts. So she went and she picked him up, and he was bleeding on her. In Houston, road rage blamed for cutting two lives short. 17-year-old David Castro was killed while leaving an Astros game last summer. And just last week, Tyler Mitchell died after being shot during a road rage incident on I-10. Family members say he was making plans to celebrate his 22nd birthday. An investigation by a Houston station found highways, roads, streets, and alleys are the second most common place homicides occur in the city. Enough is enough. This, this world needs to get to where everybody can get along. Courtney Bradford was a young man with the world before him, about to be married, had just bought a new home with his fiance and he so loved and doted over their five-year-old daughter. It's, it's very hard. I still have those moments where I forget. I've called him by mistake. But he'll never answer. Courtney was shot and killed while riding on Interstate 240 in Memphis. His mother says it's her faith that has helped her stay strong during her grief. I don't have any more children. My prayer has been, Lord, don't let me lose my mind. And so far, he's keeping me. The shooting that took Courtney's life was one of the 121 interstate shootings Memphis police responded to in 2021. It's insane. Now I get antsy when I'm on the expressway. The data shows the surge in highway and street shootings coincided with the overall spike in gun violence that accompanied the pandemic. We haven't seen this kind of increase since the 90s. You got more people carrying, more stolen guns. This is the pandemic effect. Some police departments are responding. In Illinois, they're trying to do a better job of tracking suspects with new cameras along the interstates. They're also doing more patrols and searches to arrest people with illegal weapons in their vehicles. We will use license plate readers. We will use our air operations. We will use our patrol officers that are out there. We'll use canines. We'll use all the tools that are at our disposal to be able to pursue the people that are responsible for this violence. Police are trying to stop these shootings before they happen, because when these crimes do happen in traffic, they can be much more difficult to solve. The evidence in the crime scene is moving sometimes 70, 80, 90 miles an hour. Police departments in the Detroit area are hoping to add cameras to their efforts to cut down on interstate crimes. Officers say they've seen an average of five freeway shootings a month over the past three years. Nobody's looking to write a ticket for speeding with, the, with, with cameras on the freeway. We're talking about cameras that can save lives if someone uses a weapon on a freeway, which puts every single person, every family at risk in every community, not just Detroit. Detroit police teamed up with more than three dozen other law enforcement agencies to launch Operation Bryson last year. It's a multi-city effort aimed to crack down on freeway shootings. The operation was named after two-year-old Bryson Christian, who was killed last year when someone opened fire on his family's vehicle on I-75. Police say it was a case of mistaken identity. Living without Bryson, all the memories, you know, it's still 
makes me teary-eyed. Two alleged gang members have been charged with murder in Bryson's death, but there's still no resolution to Courtney's murder. LaToya has done interviews on radio, TV, and social media trying to spark interest in his case. We don't know what happened at all. We don't know who's involved. Even if police do find the killer, she knows it won't bring Courtney back. I don't want anyone to ever feel what I feel. I don't want anybody to feel what she feels. I pray a lot, because one thing I don't want to be is angry, because that's what I was at first. I was angry, I was confused, and I was in disbelief, and you know, some days I'm still in disbelief. We gonna keep praying and we gonna keep the faith. That's all I have. A powerful story there by Pierre Thomas. Turning now to the U.S. Soccer Federation, which reached a historic agreement today to pay all national players equally, including at World Cups. The deal ends a years-long fight between the U.S. women's national soccer team and the Soccer Federation over receiving the same pay as their male counterparts. ABC News' Alexis Christophorus has more from New York. In a landmark deal, the U.S. Soccer Federation has agreed to pay players on its men's and women's teams equally. U.S. Soccer President Cindy Parlo Cohn calling it a historic moment. You know, it's game-changing moment here in the U.S., but it has the potential to change how international soccer and international sport do business um, with the equalization of prize money um, for a men's and women's World Cup. The deal closes the pay gap in prize money between what soccer's governing body, FIFA, awards for the men's and women's World Cups. Shot, In 2019, the U.S. women's title came with a $4 million prize compared to the $38 million purse France's men's team took home for their World Cup win in 2018. Under the collective bargaining agreements, the teams will pool the prize money from their respective World Cup appearances and split the total among the two teams and the federation. The U.S. will be the first nation to give all of its male and female World Cup players the same money. The men are saying, and U.S. soccer is saying, these US, the women are worth it. They're so powerful. They bring fans and viewers to the game. With their four World Cup titles and four Olympic gold medals, the U.S. women's national soccer team has been at the forefront in the fight for equal pay, far outperforming the achievements of the men's team. The milestone deal comes three months after the U.S. women's soccer team and the federation reached an historic agreement in a gender discrimination lawsuit. Megan Rapino reacted to that earlier legal victory on GMA. This this gives women now just such an opportunity to go out and just play and just be the best that they can. For more now, let's bring in ABC News contributor and USA Today sports columnist Christine Brennan. Christine, thank you so much for joining us tonight. First, I have to get your reaction to the end of this six-year battle between the athletes and U.S. soccer. Would you call this a favorable outcome? Absolutely. A favorable outcome for the women and the men went along, which is a real statement about where young men are today in the era of Title IX. And they're Title IX males supporting women athletes as never before. Um, this is a huge victory for U.S. women's soccer. These are the icons going back to Mia Hamm and Brandi Chastain and, and Brianna Scurry and, and Julie Foudy to, of course, now Megan Rapino and Abby Wambach earlier. I mean, these are the people who are, are bringing fans into to the stands and bringing uh, eyeballs uh, to the internet or uh, to television screens. And, and they're the most successful, four Olympic gold medals, four World Cups, and they weren't being paid anywhere near what the men are being paid. Now it's a statement to the rest of the world. Most countries do not treat women's soccer anywhere near how the United States even was before. Uh, the misogyny and the sexism around the world is extraordinary in the sport. And the United States has said today, enough is enough. And, and as you said, that wasn't the case just here in the U.S., but around the world and not just with soccer, but sports at large. So what do you think that this means for the fight for equal pay across all professional sports, including the National Women's Soccer League and beyond? This is a landmark moment. This is something that now everyone can look to and say, look, look at what happened here uh, and maybe move forward. I'm not sure that there are there are different it's apples to oranges in some ways when you look at pro leagues, because if they are um, obviously this is capitalism and if they're making more money, the NBA obviously has been around a lot longer than the WNBA. When you consider that the men's World Cup started in 19. 30. That was the first time men played soccer in the World Cup. And the women's didn't start till 1991. That's a 61 year head start. 
And now, at least in the United States, they've caught up. A few other countries are talking about trying to make things more equal. The vast majority couldn't care less about women's soccer, even today. And this is the United States saying, uh, look at us. And so it has to have a ripple effect. It has to reverberate through other sports. Will it happen tomorrow? No. But is it possible it will happen in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, especially as more women athletes then become uh, consumers and want to buy tickets and want to bring their daughters to watch uh, the, these female role models? This shows the way. But as you said, pointing out the, the NBA compared to the WNBA, there are some factors where you're comparing apples to oranges and things are likely not going to be the exact same. What do you think it would take? How do, how do we work around that? I certainly think that you declare victory on women's sports as we approach the 50th anniversary of Title IX next month. I think you declare victory with participation and with the steps that have been taken so far. The glass is definitely half full, not half empty. Today is the greatest day to be a woman in sports until tomorrow. That's what progress looks like. It's not as fast as many of us would like it to be, but this day, equality, equal bonuses, equal pay, a pool of money for both World Cups that the players will make equally, uh, and even the men getting childcare. The women had that, now the men get that. Uh, and obviously some of the sponsors who wanted to associate only with the women's game, well, the men will now benefit as well. One American team, all these young people growing up in a very different world than their parents or grandparents, and it's the same with all the Olympic sports, in addition to soccer, swimming, gymnastics, track and field, figure skating, et cetera. And the idea is to pay men and women equally because, of course, a lot of the stars in these Olympic sports are women. Yeah, and Christine, I love your outlook. You said today is the greatest day to be a woman in sports until tomorrow. That is progress. And finally, I want to ask you, what about for women across all workplaces? As you are well aware, equal, play, equal pay is not just an issue for athletes. What happens after this? Sports often leads us to national conversations that we have to have. And whether it be after Super Bowl or whether it be Colin Kaepernick and, and the important issues that he, of course, has raised, um, sports takes us to that place and is almost a common denominator. And so I think because of this news and how big a deal it is and the worldwide attention to it, my guess is that uh, there will be people in workplaces tomorrow, men and women, uh, maybe talking about this. Maybe there'll be a woman who's fighting an equal pay battle at an insurance company or in a factory who will have a little bit more bounce in her step as she looks at her heroes, the Megan Rapinos of the world, and, and says, okay, they can do that, I can do it as well. And again, it's something you can go to a position, person in a position of authority in a company, and you can say, look what just happened in soccer. Look at the effort that was made, not only by the women who really worked hard for all these years, and it's not just six, seven years, it's it's three decades of fighting really for equal pay all the way back to the 90s, um, but also, and even the 80s, to be honest, um, but also um, it's the men who have agreed that the women deserve that. That is a watershed moment when you've got the guys saying, yes, we want to share this money with the women. They deserve it. They win more than we do. They're better known than we are. We accept that. We honor that. And we want to be a part of a partnership with them. Let's hope it takes uh, over not only in workplaces around the country, but around the world on playing fields where right now girls and women are not getting anywhere near the kind of attention and the respect that they deserve that U.S. soccer and the men and women of, of the sport are now being shown today from sports fields and courts around the world. Christine Brennan, thank you so much for joining us tonight. My pleasure today. Thank you. And still to come here tonight, a polio outbreak in Mozambique. We'll have the latest. Plus, the baseball team trying to bring fun back to the baseball diamond. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, 
and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. And we're tracking several headlines around the world, starting with Mozambique, which declared a polio outbreak on Wednesday after detecting its first case of the virus in nearly three decades, the World Health Organization has said. Polio invades the nervous system and can cause irreversible paralysis within just hours. There is no cure for polio, but infection can be prevented through vaccination. Genomic sequencing suggests the newly confirmed case is actually linked to a strain that began circulating in Pakistan in 2019. The Salvadoran Navy seized a shipment containing over 1,700 pounds of cocaine. When authorities inspected the vessel, they found drug packages hidden in the cargo area. El Salvador's Minister of Defense has said two of the detainees are of Ecuadorian origin, while the third detainee is a Colombian national. All detainees, we're told, will be charged with illicit drug trafficking. And Britain's Royal Mint, check it out there, has unveiled a special new commemorative rainbow-colored 50 pence coin as a tribute to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Pride UK movement. The coin honors the anniversary of the first official Pride UK event back in 1972 and is the first to be dedicated to Britain's LGBTQ plus community. The commemorative coin will not enter circulation, but it will be available to purchase online for all those coin collectors out there. Well, now to a baseball team with a special appeal of sorts. Here's ABC's Will Gans. We go to every city with 120 performers. A dad bod cheerleading squad, the Mananas, all right? We have our senior citizen dance team, the Banana Nanas. We have break dancing coaches. We have Princess Potassia. We have a player in stilts. Since its inaugural season in 2016, the Bananas have had the same goal. Very simple. It, it's just to make baseball fun. You know, we've we've seen the game, what's happened, the challenges, the game's getting longer, losing the, the young audience. And we said, let's just make the game as fun as possible. The team managing to hit a line drive right into that sweet spot where entertainment meets athleticism. So the tryouts, you know, when the guys came, we had a dance station. So not only that, we had a TikTok station, you know, which is crazy to think, you know, now we have 2.5 million TikTok followers, about 1.8 million more than any Major League Baseball team. TikToks like this one going viral. Are there ever any ideas that are like, okay, maybe that one went too far, or let's not try that again? Oh, geez. I mean, Flatulence Fun Night was a failure. Uh, the Living Pinata, uh, the Horsehead Race, the first ever baseball halftime show, Pregnant Night. I could keep going. So maybe an occasional swing and a miss, but for the most part, the fans love the fellas in yellow. I like that celebration a lot. And that is our show for tonight. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Janae Norman. Thank you for streaming with us and have a good night. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings.